terms that we are using from the physical world and applying it to a spiritual reality of God that he technically doesn't have, but it's useful to us to understand the function, okay? The part that I wanted for us to touch on, okay, uh, became, uh, has to do with how the, the believer, the part that the believer plays in, uh, rather the part that understanding the nature of God and how it actually affects us. And part of that has to do with understanding the the role of the holy spirit in the life of the believer okay uh in order for us to really get deeper into that uh there needs to be a um well we we we've already laid down some groundwork right first of all god is he is invisible right we know that that god is God doesn't have a body, although he can create one in order to manifest himself, okay? So just as he did in the Old Testament, you know, God, you know, and, and what's interesting is that whenever God wanted to reveal himself, uh, he did so, so in, in different ways to where Jewish rabbis, Jewish uh, sages, they always wondered because they understand that God is invisible. But there are moments in the Old Testament where there is, uh, where you have Yahweh who's invisible, but then there's a visible Yahweh, right? Which is like the, we refer to him as the angel of the Lord, right? And a lot of times you'll, you'll see that in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is, is standing or he's doing something in, in a physical sense. And then you have Yahweh who's invisible and the wording in the Old Testament, they kind of blur the two together they kind of merge them as if well we know that Yahweh is invisible and yet this angel is being called Yahweh because he's being because he's he's applying but yet there's there's this Yahweh the visible Yahweh seems to respond to the other Yahweh right and so you have this they they've come up with um well, back in ancient times, they came up with what was called the two powers doctrine, maybe even the three or four powers doctrine, because they saw that God, that you had the invisible Yahweh, and then you have the visible Yahweh, and you have these, this dichotomy, right? Because it seems to be contradictory in a sense, if you think, well, if God is invisible, why is this angel call also called Yahweh? You understand? Um, it would, the, in the name of the, the angel itself was very uh, unique in that, you know, while Israel was in the wilderness, this angel was a visible representation of the invisible God. And <clears throat> if you really think about what that means, the angel of the Lord was visible and lived among the children of Israel for 40 years in the desert. Yeah, they could see him every day. Now, if God were to appear in his full reality of everything that he is, what would happen? Yeah. Right? Okay. Obliteration, right? We wouldn't be. <laughs> well, he can't and us still be here. And right. He be here. Yeah, we, we, we would cease to exist. You understand? Yeah, because everything would be utterly, you know, annihilated because right. nothing can stand before him. You understand? And, and being, because he's invisible, it would require everything else to literally disappear. So it's annihilation. So what does he do is he, he causes a, an effect by producing a body that can be approachable, relatable, that we can behold without dying. <laughs> you understand what I mean? So, and, and he specifically told Moses, he says, beware of him. Now he's referring to the angel as a him. Now he's saying, don't beware of me. He said, beware of him, right? Why? Because the angel is a physical embodiment that is a, of a lesser quality, so to speak, if I could say it that way, of the invisible God that has no limits. He's a concentrated moment in history where he can be seen and experienced, and God refers to him as him. 
because God is God. He's, he can manifest in multiple multitude of ways. And so the angel, he told him, he says, beware of him and obey his voice and do not disobey what he, what he tells you because my name is in him and he will not pardon your transgression. <laughs> right? That's what I was thinking of. Like <laughs> you forget that he also, because he embodies God himself, that he would also have to embody God's judgment if you disobey. Yeah. So like he's there to help, but he will not cease to be God in a sense of cease to be God's judgment upon you if you if you disobey his words. So yeah. I think that's that God is like trying to warn you, like, you know. <laughs> so, you know, uh this thing, man, with you know, understanding the 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 nature of God, how you know, we have God in the Father is completely and utterly invisible. He has no, he has no uh, incorporeality. So he is limitless because he is not confined to a body. Okay. And because he's not confined to a body, he is greater than any version of, of, of himself, so to speak, that he can manifest, whether it's a, uh, you know, a human body, uh, a burning bush or a pillar of cloud every visible manifestation of god is a rest is restricted to that time and space and location when because god is invisible in his true nature that means that he is not subject to time space and location he's outside of time and space because all of that is material anyway right god is spirit okay now, with that being said, if God is spirit, then there are other aspects of God's reality that are made of the same, or if I could say made, that are of the same essence as himself that also conveys a reality of, of, of himself as he truly is. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, because the Holy Spirit is invisible, right? We don't see the Holy Spirit you know, we see the spirit doing things, but we don't necessarily see it, you know, actually in a physical body. We don't see the three. We see God the Father. We see, you know, as being the invisible, in, unlimited, all-powerful, all-knowing God. And, but, we also, but we actually behold the Son. The physical Son is what we actually see with our eyes, is what we behold. But through the Son, the Father is manifested by His invisible Spirit. Mm. Okay? His invisible Spirit, the Spirit of the Father, is the Spirit of Jesus. So it's almost as if you have the Father, and then there's a, a lower expression of the Father, which is the Son, and then a lower expression of that as the Holy Spirit. And each one of those expressions is a function that makes it possible for the creation to approach him mm. understand so we touched on before how that the father because he he's unlimited he's invisible right and that he doesn't have a body the idea that god has no limits and no physicality to himself means that he doesn't sit in a chair like we think of the throne of god like he's sitting on a chair you know chest out big muscles and everything just, you know speaking in like you know these massive tones you know and like oh from the belly of god and uh and and the thing is is that that's an image that we've created but that's not the reality of who god is because uh, and and i kind of wrote this in my book you know God is not sitting in a chair, in a room, in a palace somewhere in heaven. Because the Bible says that heaven is his throne and yeah. that the earth is his footstool. Now, question. If you look outside your window right now or, and you look up in the sky, are you going to see big, massive feet? No. No. 
likewise, if you go to heaven, you're not going to see a massive buttocks, <laughs> massive divine buttocks ahead of, of above you. You're not going to see that. Okay. And, and the reason for that, because those are conceptual ideas. Those are for you to understand. Okay. That heaven is, is his throne. The idea is that that's where he rules and reigns from. Oh, where we can understand the term throne. Exactly. Just another word used to relate to us. Exactly. So in and the earth is where he will establish his peace. That's why his feet, you know, are that's why the 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 that he that his throne that the heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. He stands upon the earth, not in a physical sense, but in a conceptual sense. Because that's where he wants to establish his peace. Oh, I and, thought it just meant that that's because the earth stinks because his feet's there. No, no. God doesn't <laughs> say. He smells like roses. He smells like roses. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bad joke. Bad joke. <laughs> All right. So, so to, to put these in perspective, the uh, because God is not in the context of a being in a chair in a building, whatever. If that were the case, if God was to sit in a chair, I'm not saying that he can't create a chair. I'm not saying that he can't create a palace. I'm not saying he can't do any of those things. What I'm saying is, is that if there was an inherent location where he dwelt, that was, you know, that, that was beyond him, then that would supersede him. That would be, transcend him. You understand? Therefore, these are... These we, we use what the uh, theologians refer to. These are anthropomorphic terms. These are terms that we are using from the physical world and applying it to a spiritual reality of God that he technically doesn't have, but it's useful to us to understand the function. Okay. Like Jesus and his parables. Yeah, exactly. Same way. So every single thing in regards to the, the, the work that, that God does, like it, God doesn't move around like he doesn't get, you know, because if you're sitting in a chair, you can get up and walk around in the room. You can leave the room and go outside into the palace or go into your courtyard or whatever you want to do, right? God is not like that. There is no such thing as space outside of God. There's no such thing as room outside of God. There's nowhere for him to move to. He exists. He is self-sufficient in of himself. He doesn't, he doesn't live in a void. The void lives within him. You understand? The, the, Paul says that in him we live and move and have our being. And he wasn't talking to unbelievers. He was talking to pagans. Mm. So we have to remember that. All that exists, whether things seen or unseen, were created by and for him and exist within himself. Nothing exists outside of him. He is the boundary for all reality. Outside of God, there is no such thing. That's, that's a false statement because there is no such thing. Outside of God is only God himself because there is no such thing as outside. <laughs> so people might take that to mean like you can't die outside of God like everybody is saved and things like that but that's not what you're saying you know you're just talking about the basis of reality if there's something outside of god he's no longer infinite which would mean that he's not god if there was exactly. something outside of him exactly because something else would transcend him nothing right. transcends him now within his creation he can manifest things of himself within the creation and even within the creation he can isolate things from his manifest presence, but he's still there. Like Paul, like David said, if I go to the highest heaven, you're there. If I go to the deepest hell, you're still there. His manifested presence is not there. Right. So that doesn't right. mean that God himself, that this is outside of God. Exactly. Himself. It right. just that you will not experience anything of who he truly is there. Right. So you know, every single thing that God does, he has to do it within himself because there's nothing, nothing for him to do outside of himself. Outside of himself doesn't exist. There is no outside. 
So all that exists, whether it's seen or unseen, exists within his being. All of the, all the universe, every version of, if, if I could say any parallel universe, any dimension, whatever you think could exist does not exist outside of him. Mm-hmm. All of it exists within him. So when you grasp that, then that means, well, you know, what does the Bible mean when it says that God moves or that God, you know, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is where the language is very particular in the Bible, because if you look there, um, there are certain aspects to, to God. Okay. That, um, okay. There are certain aspects to God that are unique to his nature. And in the Bible, the spirit of God is always presented in a particular context. The first time that we ever see the spirit of God mentioned is in the very beginning. It's in Genesis chapter one, verse two, where it says, you know, verses one and two says this, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters or brooded okay if you look up you actually have to open up your concordance okay and look up where every port part in the scripture where the spirit of god is mentioned it's always in the context of god of of the spirit of god is moving action is taking place go ahead one one translation says that like the spirit of god was hovering over the water hovering yeah why don't you say hovering because hovering you're not really moving right I, I don't like that context why would it say that when if you look up in the hebrew it doesn't really denote the same hovering that we would okay so y- you have to kind of think in terms of again there's anthropomorphic things here's a question is the spirit of god above the waters in that passage I don't even know how to answer. That's a trick question. It's not a trick question. It's actually pretty straightforward. Is it's that you're not going to answer it wrong. Is the spirit of God above the waters? Yeah, it's it's, it's said that hey, it was. Here's a question. Is the spirit of God below the waters? I mean, is God below the waters or is the spirit of God? Because Same the thing. Spirit of God was the man of spirit of God is God. All right. We're, we're at the, the spirit of God is God. So here's the question. Is the spirit of God above the waters or below the waters? Yes. Yes. Right. Is he in heaven? Yes. Yes. Is he everywhere? Yes. Right. And this is before he created anything. Right. So we have to understand that, that the, the spirit of God, the presence of God is everywhere already. The connotation is in the context of he's brooding. He, there's movement taking place. He's stirring up waters. He's stirring up because the idea is that, first of all, there's chaos. Okay? Uh, when it says that, um, that in, uh, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Right? So, tohu obohu in Hebrew means full of destruction, chaos. Okay? It, there, there was chaos happening. The spirit of God is the is a force that's about to bring another subjection. Now, there's why would there be uh, chaos there? Because we, we have a lot of like the chaos theory and, and the gap theory and, and a bunch of things. <clears throat> yeah, so so oh. you, you have to understand uh, that the the chaos theory has. I don't even touch on that. For, forget forget putting a label on what happened and i'm just going to explain to you the chaos concept from a biblical worldview okay basically <coughs> the the chaos is that there, there there's this idea that that something occurred that brought disorder right All right you and i could even possibly refer to that as the fall of satan you understand and God is responding by causing something to happen. When he says, let there be light, he brings order into chaos by, by bringing light out of darkness. Okay. Right. 
So I don't want to get too deep into that, but if you want, you can read The Unseen Realm by Mike Kaiser. He actually touches on it. <laughs> um, but <laughs> when it comes to this issue of the spirit of God being presented, it's being presented in a context. One, it's as God is about to cause creation to take place. The spirit of God is present. Now think about this. As the creation is about to take place, the spirit of God is moving upon the face of the waters. And that's when God says, let there be light. So you, you have God who's about to create. That's the father. He speaks. That's his word. His spirit is moving. That's his spirit. All right. You see all three aspects of God present at the creation. Now, this is important because this lays down the groundwork for us down the road. Okay? Because God is still in the creating business. Okay? We, we can go. We'll get to that later. But this is very important that you get that because when the Spirit of God is first presented in Scripture, it's presented in the context of movement, animation. Everywhere where you see the Spirit of God mentioned, it's always in the context of movement or animation or making something animated or alive. Okay? Uh, what, there are two things that the Spirit of God is often uh, referred to. Okay, there's two examples. You have the, the Spirit of God is often referred to as wind, right? The, the, as a matter of fact, the word uh, uh, for, for wind in Hebrew is ruach. It's also the word for spirit, right? And so when you go outside and you, you see, do you actually see wind? You see its effects. Right. You see the effects. You see the, the dust blowing around. You see the trees swaying. You don't actually see wind, but you see the effects that it produces. Right. In the same, con the same way, that's why the Bible uses wind as a euphemism for the Spirit of God, because it's moving. You don't see it, but it's causing animation. It's causing movement. It's causing something that can be seen something that can be experienced okay you know, it makes a lot of sense is that um when you talked about or when the bible says that without the without the spirit the body is dead because the spirit is a moving thing right so if you don't have spirit you can't move right so and and so one way to look at this is that remember how we were talking to everything that exists exists within god the spirit of God is that part of God that moves within himself because outside of himself, he can't move. Right. But all movement that occurs, occurs within himself. Hmm. This is very important. So when you think of the Holy spirit, you have to remember that it's the part of God that causes life animation because life, the whole idea, the concept of life is that, when something is dead or inanimate, that means it has no spirit. Once you put a spirit in it, it begins to move and have life. Mm. Okay? Adam became a living soul when God breathed into his nostrils the breath, the wind, the breath of life. And that's when he became a living soul. Another euphemism that's used for the spirit is water. Okay? Now, the, the idea of water, you know what? Okay. The idea of water is different from um, is different from from wind, and that obviously you and I can see water, right? But the elements that are associated with water have to do with life giving. All right. Even scientists they, they always look for water on other planets because if there's water, there's what life. Life. Right? So. The Spirit of God is often associated with water, and in particular, living water. Living water is water that moves, right? We call those rivers, streams, rain, right? These are all 
things that are associated with the production and reproduction of life. Okay? So we have wind because of movement and animation, and then we have water because of movement and life. And both are used to reference to the spirit because the spirit moves and gives life. Right. Okay? The spirit is what gives us life, what gives us animation. It makes dead things alive. All right? The spirit of God is what makes dead things alive. So it uses these things like wind and water to help us connect the dots about the function of the Holy Spirit and the believer. That, I, I'm, that's, that's what I was thinking about just now. I'm just like all of this, you know, you're talking about how they used water. They're looking for water on Mars and things like that just because without water, there is no life. You know, you can't have life without water. Nothing can live without water. And I'm just like, you know, Think of how great that creation is, you know, how God was talking about how um, through the visible things, we understand the invisible things. So it's just like, yeah, like when you see all this water on earth, when you see the wind, there's kind of no excuse to, <laughs> to not understand that God exists because he has made everything to, to produce life, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the water and, 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 you know, this abundant source of of it and wind and everything so it's just it's just really amazing i'm like god when he made water he's just like this is good you know like like with this water right here they're really going to be able to understand me through this yes and, and and that's the same in all of creation there are aspects to creation that you and i haven't even explored yet that reveal the majesty of god you know even david said when i look up into the heavens the sun the moon and the stars they declare the glory of god you understand? And the, the, the firmament shows his handiwork. You understand? Uh, there's nowhere where you can go where their voice isn't heard. You know? So it, you have to, to, to recognize that the, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because here, here's the thing. We, we, we talk about the Trinity, right? And I've mentioned before that the Trinity is not so much the problem because the word Trinity it's just simply a term that we've come up with to co conceptualize three united, okay? Tri being three, unity is together. Trinity is the combination of those two concepts. Tri, three, unity. That's all that that is. The problem, though, that I see is that people will take the Trinity and start adding on a whole bunch of traditional jargon to try to dis explain it. And over time, people start veering away from biblical language used to describe God in the concept of the Trinity, right? There is a Trinity of sorts in the, in the New Testament, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a Trinity. But the baggage that's been attached to that word over the centuries is, is what I think brings a lot of confusion. Because the same thing with the throne. By, yes. by It's not a real throne. It's just used to describe an aspect of God, but then you attach it and make it to where if you didn't see a literal throne, then it's not heaven, you know, like. Right. And so when you think about it, you know, the, even when you go into heaven, right, is there a physical literal throne there? Yeah, there is. And who sits on that throne? One sits on that throne. Right. Right. And that one has a, what it doesn't say that in the book of Revelation, it doesn't say that, that Jesus is sitting, that when you look at the throne aspect, you don't see Jesus sitting on the right hand. You see a lamb sitting on the right hand. Mm. Okay. When you talk about Jesus on the right hand, then you see it in the sense of Jesus, the man on the right hand of the uh, of the throne of god which jesus correlates it with the power of god right okay so when you consider that the the throne aspect god can create a throne to make a part of himself visible in some form but even if you see him sitting in that chair that he's created he's still everywhere else he's everywhere else in heaven he's everywhere else on earth 
He's everywhere. He's, you can't escape him. He's everywhere. Okay. So the, the, we have to not think of God in the sense of, of constant physical terms, because that's that physicality, no matter when it appears, it's a limited scope of God given for us to be able to connect with him. Okay. So the spirit of God is that part of him that moves in order to draw attention to what God says. Mm, that's okay? good. That's what it is. That's why Jesus says that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will speak of me, and I will speak of the Father. Wow. You understand? There's this, it's a phase thing for us. So that we can take steps toward God without dying. <laughs> okay. So th this re revelation of the Spirit of God is that it is a, a it is that aspect of God that is causing us to move toward God. Okay. Very important. Because here's the thing: the let me put it this way: the goal to really understanding the role of the Holy Spirit is actually in the very first word of its title, holy. The, whole, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, because a lot of times you'll see the Spirit is doing this. Even in the book of Revelation, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the New Testament, we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not Father, Son, Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the reason for that is because of the purpose behind the of the that the relationship that's been established by this trinity of sorts the revelation of god as the father the revelation of jesus as the son and the spirit of god is holy is all for the purpose of establishing and integrating a unique relationship okay this is where the, the, the role of the Holy Spirit really plays a role, uh, uh, plays a part in, in our development in this life. Every single thing that we do, every single thing that we say, every single thing that we think, when it is governed by the Spirit, we are being conformed into vessels of holiness. We're being changed from glory to glory. We're going from a fallen human, human race to a glorified human race. From a corrupt to one made holy, separate, useful. Okay? All right? Things that you use are things that are action. Okay? That's why the Holy Spirit is, is not just an equipping aspect. It is a transformative aspect. We are changed because the spirit came to live in us. And the moment he lived in us, our nature changed. We became a new creation, a holy nation. Hmm. Because the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within us and in our midst. So even the changing of... God, spirit of God or just spirit to Holy Spirit is just a way for it to relate to spirit of God moving in us. Right. Got right. it. Okay. Because here's the thing, man. Um, the, the, the role of the spirit is to, because here's the thing, the, there's something that happened called the fall and that separated us from the, infinite life of god the fall caused man to become separated okay and that separation is what you and i refer to as death Sp right spiritual separation between man and god caused man to physically die physical death is the separation of the spirit from the body the holy spirit has now brought come into us what is what has happened now now that the spirit comes into the believer that gap that existed has now been closed 
and now we are connected to the source of life. That's why we now have eternal, the hope of eternal life. Mm. Because we have now his life living in us. I'm not talking about this body. No. We're talking never about was. even in Genesis when God said you will surely die. He's not talking about your body. Well, here's you know, technically he is and he isn't because our hope is not heaven. Our no. hope is the resurrection of the physical body. Ah, you understand? Okay. So because Jesus said that about Lazarus and he just got done raising him from the dead physically. He was about to do. So there is a connection to the body. It's necessary. Okay, it's necessary, but that comes into play later. We can touch on the resurrection on another day, but because there's a whole lot more to that than you know. Well, I was just talking as specifically as far as when Satan was uh, talking about you shall not surely die. I was thinking that he was just talking about something different as far as you will not surely die, as in you won't physically immediately drop dead. Well, but in reality, it's still a lie because... You know, I was thinking God's talking about spiritual death and Satan was talking about physical death. But in actuality, it is, a, it is just a pure lie in a sense of it's both. Well, think about it this way, too. You and I talk about death in hindsight because we've experienced death. We can look back in history and a bunch of people have died. Prior to Adam and Eve sinning, there was no such thing as death to them. They didn't know what death was. They didn't really understand the consequences of what they were doing. Right. You understand? When they, God said, you shall surely die, I'll bet you Adam said, what's that? Yeah, he didn't even ask. You know, he didn't ask. He said, okay, I guess dying is a bad thing. And I don't know what bad really is because I'm in paradise, naked with my wife. <laughs> you understand what I mean? <laughs> so he, th there's a lot there that we don't really think that maybe Adam just didn't really understand the, the gravity of what death really was because there was no such thing as death. Everything was created and sustained by God's spirit of life that permeated the entire creation. When man sinned, then death was introduced into the creation. Right. And there are people who say that um, there are two things that I want to ask about. First, um, as far as because that's what I was um, not taught, but that's what I had learned. It's just the concept of when. He said to be fruitful and multiply, but they don't even know that they're naked. You know, how do you even know what multiplying is? Because you've never seen anything multiply, you know, like even not necessarily maybe animals, but, you know, you haven't really seen that. So I'm thinking that the woman looking to get wise probably was thinking about, you know, how to fulfill the mission of multiplying, you know, with that. Like you, you think that there might have been that because they, they had no concept of that. Also, as far as even he allowed death in, uh, some people say that, that the death only applied to man and that animals were dying before then. And I was just like, if animals were dying before then, then and death didn't count, then you know, wouldn't that kind of belittle the sacrificial system? You know, so, so you know, wouldn't that kind of go against the whole death? And, and you know, I don't know. I was just, I, I'm not well, trying off topic but the, you know. the idea of death in the sacrificial system isn't necessarily the isn't the death itself it's the object that's dying right because the, the purpose of the sacrifice is to emphasize that the price for sin is the taking of innocent life not just any life innocent life so when you mm -hmm killed an animal that animal was innocent that animal didn't do the sin that you committed but the price that is paid is the shedding of innocent blood that's why for us our salvation comes through the ultimate sacrifice of god god's son giving himself up for us all because god was setting a precedent for what was to be fulfilled later and yeah, by, used, by the killing of an innocent animal to cover Adam and Eve. Right. But for with his sacrifice, it doesn't cover. It takes away. Right. Right. <clears throat> so every single thing that he did, he did it in anticipation in order to create a, a precedent for us. Because here's the thing. When you have a, a, a creature that has become corrupted by sin, 
there has to be consequences attached to your choices because mm. we were originally intended to live forever. So what does God do? He cuts off our immortality as a consequence of our sin because if he allowed man to continue living after he sinned, then man could never be uh, reconciled. Man could never be forgiven. Mm. So think about it this no, way. No the, angels, the angels, they had immortality, right? But when they sinned, they couldn't repent. Mm. When we sinned, God offered us repentance that he didn't offer them. So wow. this thing about our, our limited... Uh, our limited aspect of being human, being human, is I think part and parcel to the reasons why God extended mercy to us. It was the fact that there's so much that we didn't understand or know, and He's like, you know what? I'm going to show you mercy. These guys, they knew better. You understand? And so I'm going to hold them to a greater account. You know? And now, even now, even today, God holds us to the same to the same system, but how he approaches us is different than he would you know, approach them because there's still so much that we don't know so much that we don't understand. And God, that's why God is showing mercy, even to people that are vile and evil in the world, people that you and I would come to despise, you know, whether they be pedophiles or, or whoever they're in our mind, we might think they're just, you know, they deserve the fires of hell. And we, for, we fail to remember that we do too. <laughs> and that if it wasn't for the grace of God, we might be one of them. Right. You understand? So that's why God extends mercy even to them, but he demands repentance from all. So mm. anyway, go, going back to, the, to, to this thing about the, the nature of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, um, Jesus, you know, I, I remember when uh, listening to the DHTs with Curry, you know, we... Um, he would often talk, he had a message called uh, Jesus, the prototype son. I think that's what the name of the, or the, the prototype son. Right. And, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, Jesus being the embodiment of all that God desires, isn't just that he is the embodiment of God. He is also the embodiment of man. Right. Of the perfect man. Of the holy man of the complete man okay so jesus is the only one who perfectly demonstrated what a faithful holy son looks like in the world mm. everything that he did he did it to the father's pleasing he was holy in everything that he did every choice that he made was in direct alignment with the will of the father but you don't see the father telling him what to do you don't see the father you know, moving him like a machine, like, oh, heal, raise yeah. the dead. He wasn't like that. You understand? He, he operated as a man who had total perfect union with the Father in a fallen world. Mm. If you really think about it, Jesus was, okay, Jesus was, was given a full deck of cards. But... Here's the problem, or not say, say only Adam was given everything and he fell. Jesus was given a full deck of cards, but the world that he came in was already corrupted and he stayed faithful. Every single thing that Jesus did, he demonstrated what it was like to be led of the Spirit of God, what it was like to. Uh, to walk in the spirit, what it was like to be filled with the spirit, how to live in the spirit. Everything about the spirit was properly expressed through his life. Every choice he made, every action he did, everywhere he went, he mimicked the character and nature of God in physical form. He's a perfect representation of the Father's person. It even says that in the book of Hebrews, that, that he is the express image of his person. 
So every single thing that Jesus did. Now, Jesus did not begin his ministry until what? What event launched him into his ministry? Uh, baptism. Baptism, right? So as soon as he gets baptized, what happens? What happens at the baptism? The parting of the sky and, and you know, this is my son and, and you know. Right? The dove descending, right? Um, that's what the dove is, right? So <laughs> think about it this way. When he gets baptized, that's when the Spirit comes upon him. Right. right. The Spirit descends upon him like a dove and lighting upon him. And from that point forward, he moves into his ministry. He steps into it. But right. what does he do? Before he starts doing anything, he goes to the, the desert. Lord. Right? He goes to the desert. To, for what? To be tempted of the devil, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. This part that we're, what we're going to talk about is, is it's honestly, I, I know, okay, I know that you've heard this before, but we're going to go in a little deeper than what you've probably heard, okay? Because this moment where Jesus, he is stepping into his ministry, it's not just a ministry he's stepping into. He is literally stepping into our destiny. Mm. His ministry is our destiny. Mm. Every Explain single... Huh? Explain that one. I, I got an idea, but I want to be clear. Every but... single thing that he accomplished is within our realm of responsibility. Oh. Because we are his body on the earth. We are of his flesh and of his bones. We are extensions of himself in the same way that the Holy Spirit is an extension of the Father. Got it. Okay. Okay? And as the Father is, in, is being extended by the Son through the Spirit, we are also extensions of himself by the Spirit. The Father is invisible. The Holy Spirit is invisible. Jesus is visible. We are visible. Exactly. We are in the role of the Son. That's why God has given us the title of sons. Okay. Uh, okay. Everything that he said, everything that he did, everything that he accomplished, that is what God desires for us. He created those good works for us to step in. Because there's a whole lot of work left to be done in the world. But Jesus, has he did his part as a man, ascended up to heaven. But after he ascended, he sends down his what? His spirit. Yeah. And suddenly, uh. everything that he could do at will, now we can Unfortunately, in our generation, we're, we haven't really been taught how to, how to live out our faith in an expression of natural love for God. Everything's about works or legalism or formulas or, or everything that we, we've come up with to try to make God real to people instead of just walking it out like he is. Jesus didn't go around trying to force a nosebleed to get people to believe him. He walked in it like, this is how it is, you know? Like how people say that he did miracles to prove that he was God. No, no, no. It, the things that he did, he did because God loves the people, and he wanted to love them the way God does. Everything, mm. it says that he went about doing good healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He wandered wherever he went. It, it wasn't like he said, okay, I got to go to, to Capernaum today, uh, and I'm going to leave Capernaum. I'm going to head up to, you know, uh, in a couple of days, I, I have to take the, you know, the road down to the road of Emmaus, and then later on, I'm going to go to, you know, uh, Philippi. No, he, he didn't have a schedule like that. The woman at the well is going to come, so I'm going to need to speak to her and 
Yeah, you know, he didn't have like a, a, a calendar agenda. He's like, I check off. I did that today. Uh oh, there you go. I did that. Oh, I got to make sure I can make this appointment today. He didn't do that. He want now. I, that isn't to say that he didn't have knowledge about, you know, supernatural knowledge of people and things. He did. Obviously, he did. But he didn't go around checking a box. Oh, I did this today. He wandered around. If he didn't get to that person today, he knew he was going to get to them tomorrow. You understand? That's it was just a matter of a big deal. It yeah, like, it, it, now, it. there were some things that I think that there, were, there was timing involved. Obviously, he had a window of opportunity and he everything that he could do, he did. And he did it within the time allotted. Sometimes you see Jesus back to back to back to back to back like he's doing things. And then other times you see Jesus separating himself, not doing anything, just staying, spending time alone with God, even away from his disciples. He's like, yeah, leave me alone. <laughs> you know, he just had the, the things that he did that, you know, but, but you don't see him following um, a, a, a checklist. You see him exp doing everything as a, as a natural expression of his purpose. It's a, it's a form of natural expression of who he is as a person. We have to depart from the formulas and from the, 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 the way that we've, we've started doing church and, 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 and understand that we are the church, that we are the body, that we are expressions of the holy God to the world as sons and daughters. And so... You know, with that being said, you know, everything that Jesus did, he did it in order to express to people a facet of God, something about God's nature and character that the people needed to see. The, the, the way God approached people before was that they could not, um, they just couldn't simply approach God because people were separated from God and God had to have a, a whole system of sacrifice set up. And by the way, a system of sacrifice was already set up way before Moses. Right. Abraham did. Right. Abraham Noah did it. Did. Noah did it. They all had sacrifices before this. So they couldn't even approach God without sacrifice. But now that his son came, the relationship between God and mankind is shifting. Because God's son is here, now God no longer has a barrier between him and his creation. Now the process of reintegrating his creation back to himself in perfect union and worship, in symbiotic relationship, in this dancing and exchange of, of love and holiness between God and, and because remember the creation became corrupted. You understand? But now that his son came, now God can approach the creation and the creation not die and the creation not perish because he loves his creation. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He desires for them to come to repentance. But in order for him to do that, God had to take steps to bring his son into the world in order to demonstrate to the world what he's really like. And the thing is, is that the, the son of God, when he walked the earth, he demonstrated to us through his life, what we are called to be. His ministry is therefore our destiny because the, the every, his ministry didn't end on earth. His ministry continued after he went up to heaven. His ministry, why? Because we are him on the earth. Exactly. We are him. Right? When Paul was persecuting the church, Paul never met Jesus, as far as I know. But yet, when Jesus showed to, up to him on the road to Emmaus, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my people? He said, why are you persecuting me? Because he, ex he ex um, Jesus connects us with him in such a way that we are literally extensions of himself on the earth. His ministry is our destiny. If they, people hate us, it's because they hate him first. If they touch us, they're touching him. Mm. If they hurt us, they're hurting him. If they're persecuting us, they're persecuting him. That's the nature of the relationship. 
And what makes that possible is one thing, the Holy Spirit of God in the believer. Okay. All right. All right. We're, we're going to have to, we're going to have to cut on this one. I have um, another meeting, but uh, we, we have to continue this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cause that, th that's a perfect segue into, into that. The one thing that makes this possible, my goodness.